Hi, and welcome to module 6, the last module in video lecture 3. In the first five modules in this video lecture, we discussed calculus and the derivative in one dimension. As you might imagine, most functions in political science are not actually one dimensional. Some are, granted, but, some are, but a lot are not. Um, so to deal with that, we have to talk about multidimensional calculus. Now, as you might imagine, multidimensional calculus is actually more complicated than single-dimensional calculus. It turns out that most of the same concepts are there in place, but the major difference occurs in notation and the complexity of the algebra that you have to take that you have to do in order to calculate derivatives and optimize more than one dimension. We'll deal with the topic at length in part five of the class. But for now, it helps to have a little idea of what will be, what you should expect to see going forward if there's some gap between your taking this part of the class and part five. So what we're going to do for the rest of this module and the rest of this lecture is just to go over a little bit what happens when you move to more than one dimension, very, very briefly. Again, much more will be done on this in part five of the class. Okay. So it turns out a lot of the same concepts we dealt with for the derivative extend pretty naturally for more than one variable. Okay. So first, very briefly, we introduced functions in the previous part of the class. A function is a mapping that takes stuff in one set into stuff in another set. You can imagine that the extension of this to more than one variable is straightforward, and it turns out it is. So if I had two variables, now I have a function of two variables, x and y. If I had three variables, I can do that, and so on. And I can define my function in any way I want to. So this could be 3x squared. Maybe this is 2xy minus y cubed. Maybe this is xyz plus z squared minus 4yx um, plus 3x. Right? Anything you want it to be right? that involves the variables of which the function is a function of. Right? The arguments of the function. It can be one, two, three, or as many as you want, really. This is how you extend the function into a function of more than one variable. Straightforward, right? Um, and you'll see more of this when we get to part five of the class, but for now, that's sufficient. Okay, so how about calculus? What if I want to understand how these functions change? How the, um, what's the instantaneous rate of change in these functions? Right? The same thing we want to understand for one dimension. Well, this first one over here, right, we've already seen how to do. If you remember that the sort of rule we put forth, the derivative of a power of x is equal to the power times x to the power minus 1. So if we pull down that 2, you get 2x, and the power minus 1 would be 1, so it's 2x to the first, which is just 2x. And if that was pretty fast, don't worry, the next video lecture is solely devoted to figuring out how to calculate derivatives. Um, so it's 2x times the 3, it gives us 6x. So f of x equals 6x. But what happens when you have more than one variable? Well, it turns out you can introduce something called a partial derivative. Partial derivative. And a partial derivative is a derivative of only a part of the function, specifically the part related to a single variable. You write it like this. That kind of curly D is read partial. So you read that partial f, partial x, as compared to df, dx. This is partial f, partial x, or the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And what it means is take the derivative with respect to x, treating every other variable as if it were a constant. So we could do the second one over here, with respect to x, and we can't just put a prime on there because it'd be confusing. Is the prime related to x or y? Well, if y is a constant, then uh, this thing here, the derivative of that is the derivative of a constant, which we saw was 0. And this y is a constant as well. That's no different than 2. 
So we have a constant times x. The derivative of x is just 1. So this derivative is just 2y. And you can do the same thing for here. And the derivative of x over here. So this is a constant. We can ignore it. This is a constant. This is a constant. So the derivative of x is just 1. That gives us y z. The derivative of a constant is 0. The derivative of a constant times x is again a constant, so you have 4y. And the derivative of x again is a constant, so you get that. So all I'm doing is taking the derivative, treating everything else like a constant. Now, at this point, and that's all you take, that's all you do to take a partial derivative. Now at this point, you might be wondering why I'm telling you this now. In part five of the class, we will use these derivatives to do things like maximize multidimensional functions, maximize functions of more than one argument. For instance, if we want to maximize simultaneously decisions over policy choice of a new government and cabinet chair in that government, right? there's more than one variable. But why am I telling you this now before you even get there? And there's a straightforward reason, that you, because you might see it pretty early in your um, education, in your graduate education, and therefore, or even at the undergraduate level, and it helps to understand this early on, if you're taking this class at the same time as another class. So, I should say, you could do those partial derivatives with respect to y and z um, separately. Okay. A common multidimensional functional form in political science and statistics all social sciences generally, is this, the linear model. Right, so you have some equation that might look like that. Now what this is, we can add a constant here if you wanted to. What this is, is a linear model that says your dependent variable y is a function of three independent variables, x1, x2, and x3. And as x1 and x2 and x3 change, they cause changes in y. Right? The variation in the x's causes a variation in the y. The x's are independent variables, the y is a dependent variable. Well, how, to, how does a partial derivative relate to this? Well, consider what's the partial derivative of y with respect to x1. Well, we just said you treat everything else like a constant, so this one goes away, and this one goes away, and the constant goes away, and all you're left with is beta 1, because the derivative of x1 is just 1. So the change, the marginal change in the dependent variable y with respect to the independent variable x1 is equal to the coefficient on x1 beta 1. And this tells you, so this beta 1 coefficient can be interpreted as the marginal change in y with respect to x1 holding all other variables you've controlled for explicitly constant. And that's a useful way of interpreting statistical, a statistical linear model. Now you might ask, why did I really need to calculus for that? That's pretty straightforward. I can observe the fu that um, function right here and say, okay, well, beta 1 looks like it should be this, right? It's a line, so that's the slope of the line. That's true. But we also tend to deal with more complicated functions at times in doing statistics. Consider this one. Very similar again to the first two terms. But now the third term will have both x1 and x2 in it. We can add a constant again just, just for kicks. Right. Now how does y change in x? Now you might be tempted to, to look only at this term here, but you'd be missing over this over here. So as not to miss anything, we can take a derivative, a partial derivative. Again, we have this first term here. This is a constant, so it just goes away. This and this are both constants. So we have just beta 3 x 2. So now we've learned that the, that the rate of change of y in x is equal to this coefficient plus this other, co this other term, 
which depends explicitly on the other independent variable. So the marginal change in y with respect to x varies in the other x, in x2. And again, the marginal change in y with respect to x1 varies with the other var independent variable, x2. By using the partial derivative, you're able to identify the exact relationship of y to x1 without missing anything. And the same kind of technique can be used um, if you have more complicated statistical models that might involve, say, um, exponentials and so on. But that's it. And this is important because this particular model over here has an interactive term. It's an interactive model. It has an interaction term in it. And interpreting the interaction term accurately is an important thing to do when you're doing statistical modeling. And this partial derivative helps you do that successfully. But again, um, the reason I go through this now is so that when you get to the, if you happen to be doing statistics at the same time in this class, you can identify what you're doing with those models. But we'll be doing this in much more depth when we get to part five of the class. Okay. Thank you very much. And we'll see you in the next um, video lecture, which will cover how to actually compute the derivative in various cases. Thank you very much.